Hello, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to examine some of the darker sides of the 1920s. Even though we often refer to this as the jazz age, or the party time, or the roaring 20s with lots of positive, fun kinds of thoughts, there actually were a lot of other things that were going on kind of behind the scenes that helped to color the decade and certainly that influenced the, some of the characters that you're going to meet in The Great Gatsby. that we're going to look at are some of the things that were changing during the 1920s. And while some of these changes led to some really strong uh, positive things happening, some of them actually contributed to some of the darker parts of the 1920s. For one thing, we saw this migration of people leaving the countryside and moving into larger cities. Now, this meant that we had a more mobile society. Part of this was the use of the automobile and, and some of the industrialization that we saw. But it also meant that in many cases, these old ties of communities, home, churches, and families were being broken. People moved away from these places where they had foundations and connections into the large city where even though they were surrounded by lots of people they were very isolated and as a result more people were actually experiencing loneliness and isolation and this loss of their connection to their past. When we talk about the lost generation this is at least part of what, um, what we are talking about when we use that term. Now, just to review again what we mean by the lost generation, these were the people, for the most part, the young folks who were raised during the first part of the century, where they were told up under that father knows best kind of years, where it would be glorious to go and fight for your country, patriotism, role models, um, all of these things were really drummed into their heads. But after experiencing World War One and some of the devastating things that happened in the trenches with the gas warfare and um, watching all of this, this stuff that happened with the uh, with the war, these young people came back for the war and rejected their parents' values. They said, Mom, Dad, you got it wrong and we're not going to listen to you anymore. They became very cynical. They were known for smoking, smoking and drinking, promiscuity, basically saying, whatever you taught us, Mom and Dad, we don't believe it anymore and we're going to do whatever we want to do. Now, in the middle of this comes the 18th Amendment. Now, this was largely spurred by religious groups and by some of the really um, um, devastating things that were happening because of alcohol. There were families that were being torn apart. There were fathers who were simply picking up their paychecks and going to the bar and drinking and then neglecting or abusing their family. So it started as the sense of protecting the family and protecting the country. But after it was passed, it was largely ignored by the general public and then became disregarded and actually um, undermined. So for the first time in history, you had a significant part of the population that was breaking a federal law that basically said, eh, we know what the government says, we don't care, uh, which kind of goes along with that idea again of the lost generation of kind of thumbing their noses at what they'd been taught. Now, hand in hand with prohibition came the rise of organized crime. These two were very much connected because if you have a product that is illegal and you have a product that lots of people want and a product that lots of people can't get legally, you get this whole underground that, um, culture that arises. So we saw this um, enormous rise in this. We saw gambling and bootlegging and the police were often in on it. They were very often corrupt and being paid by the mob and bribed to, to, to look the other way. We saw the rise of drive-by shootings and a assassinations. This is not just something that you see from South Central LA. This was something that came up in the 1920s. And some of the most famous gangsters of the day, you may have heard of Al Capone or the Valentine's Day Massacre. And there'll be some little side projects that you can do to research some of these characters that were very much a uh, part of the public psyche during this time. Now, this rise in organized crime also affected things that people dealt with every day, like their sporting events. There were a lot of cheating scandals that happened during this time. Uh, most famously was probably the White Sox, which got nicknamed the Black Sox, where it became clear that eight players were actually accused of taking bribes in order to throw the game. So they deliberately played badly and lost the game in order to watch the bets pay off for the people who had bet against them. And you may have heard of Shoeless Joe Jackson, for example. And what's interesting about Shoeless Joe is even though he was convicted, he admitted to taking the money. When they went back through the games, nobody could find any evidence that he actually played any worse than he would have, that every time he got a chance to play, he seems to have done a really good job. But even so, he was became part of 
these eight players uh, from the Chicago White Sox, which became nicknamed as the Black Sox because of this dark mark on their reputation. And this idea of mob ties and cheating, you see this even mentioned in Gatsby. Watch for references to Jordan Baker, Meyer Wolfsheim, and a couple other characters that um, are going to be connected to this kind of sporting scandals and cheating. Now, the fact that this was not a perfect time was also reflected in the arts at the time. Just like today, you'll see everything from modern music kind of reflecting uh, back the culture and the, the things that are wrong and that need to be changed and the hypocrisies. A lot of the artists and writers from the jazz age were very critical of the time. Their works and things, their poetry, their music spoke about materialism, vanity, selfishness, frivolity. And we saw people like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, even F. Scott Fitzgerald himself with his book and others, um, Ernest Hemingway, and even the painter Edward Hopper, who would paint these pictures of these lonely, isolated scenes in the city. Again, people surrounded by gazillions of other people, but very much alone and disconnected. So you saw the arts also reflected some of this darker side of the age. Now, even though the 1920s saw the rise of the Harlem Renaissance, which was this real explosion and flowering of cultural arts, specifically in the African-American population located out of Harlem, New York, we also saw as a counterpoint to this a rise in intensity in the terrible, awful things that the Ku Klux Klan was doing at the time. We saw incidents like the Tulsa riots in 1921, um, the, K getting, the KKK getting much more powerful. And in general, the number and the blatancy, in other words, people of, would just come out and without any fear of punishment at all, uh, between lynchings and other kinds of terrible racial crimes were happening, particularly in the South and the Midwest during this time. So then the one hand of the 1920s, you had this discovery and appreciation of the arts and contributions of immigrants and um, African Americans. And on the other side, you had this violence and this backlash against them. And even though this was racially motivated with the KKK, there was a lot of intolerance that happened in other groups as well. There was some prosecution going on of suspected communists and anarchists. These are people who were looking at different forms of government and looking at different styles of government. And even though our constitution allows for that, um, they were being repressed or punished in many different ways that people even explored that. And then a general intolerance of immigrants. We saw Congress pass some very restrictive immigration rules during this time, uh, particularly during the Red Scare in to 1927, we saw immigrants looked on with suspicion and hostility. We saw a number of cases in the news, Asako and Vanzetti are one of the most famous, who were arrested and executed for robbery and murder. And it seems to be pretty much um, obvious by, from all of the evidence that they were indeed innocent, but just there was such a backlash because they were um, these Italian immigrants and people had this fear and this prejudice against other folks who'd come into the United States. So in several different ways, and throughout the novel The Great Gatsby, you're going to see these issues surface. Everything from prohibition to the mob, cheating in sports scandals, this intolerance of immigrants. So kind of keep your eye open for these direct and indirect references as you read the novel. And that's the end.